to this point, we've discussed some aspects of the major excess code to understanding the symbolic structure uh, of Jewish mysticism, particularly the major excess code, the Sfirot. And tonight, <coughs> I would like to conclude that discussion and therefore a discussion of topic two by looking at uh, three texts and then going on to uh, our next topic. The three texts, two of which are from the Zohar and one of which is from the Lurianic Kabbalah, are texts in which you will find some of the issues we already discussed spelled out in greater detail. These texts will also provide a further opportunity to test your understanding of the symbolic language of the Kabbalists and to see, again, how the Kabbalists dealt with a variety of theological problems, uh, such as some of those that we mentioned in the beginning of our discussion. The relationship of the infinite and the finite, the problem of evil, um, the problem of creation, uh, and so forth. So our first agenda item uh, this evening is to take a look uh, at some of the texts, <coughs> three of the texts. And when we take a look at the third text, the one uh, from Lurianic Kabbalah, this will give an opportunity for me to go in a little more depth than I had time to last time about what the teachings of Lurianic Kabbalah are, or at least what some of them are. The first text I want to take a look at is a text from the Zohar, which you have in your packet on page 13. Um, actually, you also have it in your packet in a different translation on page 14. So if you compare the translations, you can, you can see that the texts are never clear. Then the second text I want to take a look at is the one beginning on page 15, and then finally the um, text from the Lurianic Kabbalah, God's Withdrawal, which you will find on page 19. Now, this first text uh, that you have, um, text uh, page 13, is uh, from the Zohar, from their commentary on the very first verse of the Bible. The very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And as you remember, for the Zohar, things are occurring on many levels at the same time. And in terms of this text, they are concerned with what this text in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, tells us about what's going on within the inner life of God. In other words, you have a kind of parallelism going on here. You have the Bible, the biblical text, explaining the unfolding of the creation of the world, God creating the world, and on the esoteric level, on the Kabbalistic level, on the symbolic level, you also have, or if you want on the theosophical level, you also have a discussion of God's, in effect, creation of himself. God's unfolding of himself, which for the Zohar means the movement from the Ein Sof, from God as God is in essence, to the beginning of the unfolding of the Sfirot, namely the beginning of the manifestation, if you will, of the divine personality. So would someone like to take a crack at reading this? It's in English, in case you haven't noticed. Where are we? We're on page 13. We're in the beginning. In this week of the World Series, we're in the beginning. Mm -hmm. When the king conceived, ordaining. That's it. He engraved engravings in the luster on high. A blinding spark flashed within the concealed of the concealed from the mystery of the infinite a cluster of vapor in formlessness, set in a ring, not white, not black, not red, not green, no color at all. When a band spanned, spanned it yielded. All right, let's, let's stop here for a minute. When the king conceived ordaining, who do you think is the king? 
Well, obviously it's God. All of this is God. And so, and so is the king conceived ordaining. In other words, the idea of the unfolding of his, the divine personality. He engraved engravings on the luster on high. In other words, Ein Sof begins the process of unfolding. And it begins with engravings on a kind of sphere of ether that surrounds the Ein Sof. And this, these engravings become, in effect, the genetic code of the spherot. And this first sphere in which the engravings are made become the first of the ten emanations, namely Keter or the crown. So in other words, within Keter, within the first of the ten emanations, you already have, in a sense, the genetic code or the potential for all of the other ten emanations. Then a blinding spark flashed. The Aramaic here is Butsina Dinahora, which means a dark light, literally. And here you have a very typical expression of the language of the mystics, where they like to use paradox. A dark light. How can a light be dark? In other words, they take the view, later taken by the great American philosopher Whitehead, that a paradox is not a uh, catastrophe, <coughs> rather a paradox is an opportunity. That truth is accessible through paradox, maybe more than it's accessible through logic. Within the concealed of the concealed, that's Ein Sof, from the mystery of the infinite, that's Ein Sof, a cluster of vapor in formlessness, set in a ring, namely a ring around the limits of Ein Sof, because remember there's, for the Zohar, Ein Sof and then a void. Not white, nor black, nor red, nor green. No color at all. And this is the idea that the Svirot represent the essence of Ein Sof, encapsulated in different vessels. We discussed this last time. When a band spanned, it yielded radiant colors. The radiant colors are the different colors represented by the lower spherot. In other words, each of the lower spherot is assigned a different color. And in different Kabbalistic systems, they are assigned different colors. But generally, as we discussed, say, for example, Chesed, Divine Grace, is almost always assigned white, and Dean, or Divine Justice, is almost always assigned uh, red. So this idea of the colorless, sort of colorless stuff emanating out of Ein Sof, and then the differentiation into colors, is its way of saying, that the divine then differentiates itself into attributes or powers or forms of expression. Deep within the spark gushed the flow. The flow is the flow coming from Enso. Remember I gave you last time this rather bizarre analogy of the Welsh's concentrated grape juice flowing down. So this is the flow coming from Enso, who is like an infinite sea imbuing colors below, namely as the flow goes down into the various spherot, it becomes differentiated into various colors or different attributes of the divine, concealed within the concealed <coughs> of the mystery of the infinite. And now again you have another paradox, very typical. The flow broke through and did not break through its aura. So the flow is coming down from Ein Sof. The aura is this sort of vapor around Ein Sof that forms the first emanation, or Keter, and it breaks through and doesn't break through. And this is their uh, response to the problem of the transition of the infinite to the finite. It breaks through, namely because you have all the stuff coming below, the Sphirot and, and eventually the worlds, but it doesn't break through, which may allude to the idea 
that the whole spheroidic structure, including and then our world, is simply a an illusion in the divine mind. In other words, that from our point of view, all of this differentiation exists, but from God's point of view, maybe it doesn't. It was not known at all. In other words, the first emanation, Keter, or the crown, is identified with the attribute of divine will. And it's not until you come to the second emanation of Chachma, or knowledge, that you have the beginning of the manifestation of divine intellect. And therefore, this cannot be known because knowledge hasn't come into being yet. See? You can't know until this point down. So, therefore, the nature of Ein Sof is above human knowledge, and the nature <coughs> of Keter is also above human knowledge, because it occurs before the divine uh, intellectual capabilities begin to manifest themselves. Now, you can't even actually say before and after here, because before and after are temporal phrases, right? Before and after. And all of this occurs beyond time. All of this is occurring within God, so there is no before and after. <coughs> but you have to take it kind of figuratively. So it was not known at all until the impact of breaking through, namely it broke through the sphere, broke through the aura, and a hidden point shown. Now the hidden point is the point that comes out of Keter, emanates out of Keter, and that's the point that becomes eventually Chachma. And what you have here is a kind of explosion, according to one view of Chachma, and that creates all of the other spherot. And some modern contemporary commentators have tried to show some kind of similarity between this idea of everything coming from the explosion of a very condensed point, in Hebrew they use the word nikuda <coughs> for point, to the Big Bang Theory in astrophysics, where you have the idea that everything comes from a very, uh, you know, essentially small uh, group of, uh, bit of mass, and then explodes, and that's where you have the universe from. I'm not an astrophysicist, and I don't really care. What, that point was... It's the beginning of Keter. It's the beginning, rather, of Chachma. Yeah, and where did it come in before? It comes, emanates out of Keter, okay. sort of shoots out of Keter. Yeah, and that becomes the seed, in a sense, for the other emanations. And you'll see that later, in, one, in the next text, they compare uh, this point to the, uh, to the uh, Hebrew letter Yud. And remember, the Keter is the male emanation. So this is, in a sense, in a, uh, sort of like the, the sperm for the for the, you know, carrying the genetic code of, of the rest of the spherot. But we'll, we'll see that later on. Mr. Hoffman? Is, is the divine, the flow referred to here, is that the, is it called Shefa? Or, or does that come later? No, this isn't the Shefa. Shefa is, is the flow. Yeah. But Shefa is later on. Again, you can't say later or earlier, so I don't really want to say later, but uh, Shefa generally refers to the flow down, but to the ability of the human being through doing certain things to cause that flow to come down. A flow of grace, a, for, a flow of good stuff <coughs> to come down. That's usually the context in which they use the word Shefa. Would you write down what? Shefa. Shefa? All right, so beyond this point, nothing is known because this is the beginning of the unfolding of intellect. 
and it is called beginning. Chachma, one of its code names is beginning, because you have a verse in the Proverbs that says the beginning of knowledge is awe of God. Reshit means in Hebrew beginning, and you have this verse Reshit Chachma Yirat Hashem. So remember, each of the Sfirot has many different code names and operates on many levels at the same time. So this is the beginning, even though this is the beginning, because this, remember, is sort of folded into the Ein Sof. So it's not a clear differentiation. So this is the beginning of the differentiation of the divine personality. May I ask, uh, what word did you use? Ma Hashem. Yirat Hashem. Yirat Hashem. Thank you. I didn't use it, the Proverbs used it. Thank you. And you gave it to us. Well, you can take it yourself, it's there. <laughs> I'm not hiding it. Notice I asked for it. <laughs> okay, you asked for it, you got it, but it's not a Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> the enlightened will shine like the Zohar of the sky. Here you have, of course, the word Zohar, it means illumination. And those who make the masses righteous will shine like the stars forever and ever. So they have to come up with a verse, you know, all the time. Now they're going to move to the third emanation. Zohar, concealed of the concealed, concealed of the concealed is ain't so, struck its aura. This is the aura. The aura touched and did not touch this point. Again, the use of paradox. Again, this fudging on the transition from the infinite to the divine, to the uh, finite. Touched and did not touch the point. In other words, just as Keter touches but doesn't touch Ein Sof, so the point, which is Chachma, the second emanation, touches and doesn't touch the aura. The aura is Keter. So the transition from here to here is similar to the transition from there to there. Then this beginning emanated. The beginning is Chachma, the second emanation. He emanates. And how does he emanate? He makes himself a palace for glory and, and praise. And this palace becomes the third emanation. And the third emanation is Bina, or divine wisdom which is the palace of the king. And of course, Bina becomes the queen. And this is the beginning, as we discussed, of the sexual differentiation of the Svirot, Chachma being the first male emanation, and Bina being the first female emanation. So, the beginning emanates and makes itself a palace, and there it sowed the seed of holiness. In other words, the palace, which is Bina, the first female emanation, turns into a place where he sows the seed, namely it turns into a womb. The seed is sowed by Chachma, the male emanation, in the womb. The seed contains the future of, or the potential for the lower emanations. So the seed of holiness, and that's why Bina is also called the upper mother. Chachma, the upper father. Now if you study your chart well of the Sfirot, if this is the upper mother and this is the upper father, who is the lower mother and lower father? Right. Tiferet and Malchut are the lower father and lower mother. Okay, so so is the seed of holiness to give birth for the benefit of the universe. In other words, the unfolding of the divine personality has to occur first before eventually you have the creation of the universe. 
And then, of course, they have to, <coughs> again, quote a verse. And then they begin the next paragraph like they've begun some of the others. Zohar is sowing a seed for its glory like the seed of a fine purple silk. The silkworm wraps itself within and makes itself a palace. This palace is its praise and a benefit to all. So they're comparing the palace of Bina to a silkworm. Now comes the, the critical part. With the beginning, the concealed one, who is not known, created the palace. This palace is called Elohim. The secret is, with beginning, dash, created Elohim. So here again, we come to their interpretation of the first verse in the Bible. First verse in the Bible is Breshit in the beginning. Bara created God. In the beginning, God created. Right? We all know that. But here they are interpreting it on the level of the unfolding of the spherot. And what does it mean in their interpretation? Like this. Reshit. See, ber reshit. What is reshit? First. Not here. Chachma. Remember? Reshit is one of Chachma's names. The Hebrew word ba which here means in the, can also mean with. Mm -hmm. So they are interpreting it with reshit, namely with chachma, emanation number two, bara creates Elohim. Elohim in the way the Zohar is reading it, now becomes the object of the sentence instead of the subject of the sentence. With Chachma dash, see the dash there, dash creates Elohim. Who is Elohim? Elohim is one of the code names, if you studied your chart, for, no, obvious for God, for Bina. So therefore, it reads it like this. With beginning, with Chachma, Dash created Bina. Who's Dash? They tell you who's Dash. The concealed one who is known, who is not known, ain't so. So therefore, the Zohar interprets the first verse, or the first three words of the Bible as not in the beginning God created, but with Chachma, Ein Sof created Bina. With emanation number two, Ein Sof created emanation three. Nice. You got it? I'll give you another one they throw in here, another text. You have a verse in Isaiah. Me bara ela. Means it's a rhetorical question. Who me bara created ela these? In other words, the prophet says, look at the world, who created these? Obviously God. So the Zohar says, well, why even ask this question? It's obvious who created these. What does this really mean? Ready for this? Bara is what? To create. Okay, now, take a look at the two words. Me means who? 
Ela means this. You got it. If you add these letters to these letters, you have Elohim. See that? Elohim. So they go further and they say Bina has two parts, upper part and lower part. And the upper part, called Mi, creates the lower part, called Ela, and that equals So they, can, they take all these verses and they just read them rather than being about our world, about what's going on uh, in the upper world. It's better than video games. At least sometimes you can win. I never win at video games. Okay, do you have any questions on this text? Is it clear what's going on here? Yes, it's not clear. Not? What's not clear? Uh, they would sow the seed of holiness to give birth for the benefit of the universe. Yes, because if, if uh, Chachma did not sow the seed that then allows Bina to give birth to lower emanations, there'd be no world. Yeah, please. Is there any discussion of the extent of the getting out from the UK when I'm trying to figure out this, the distinction between any soap and these few ropes? All of this unfolding, is there a discussion of to what extent that is fully complete within any soap and it just comes out like, like you know, the little fire print thing that's going shooting up in the sky on the 4th of July and contains in itself all of the uh, uh, fireworks? And to what extent it actually is dependent on things going on in the world of the Spirot as opposed to in and so? I'm missing something. Totally. You mean is it a one-shot deal or is it continual? Is it going on? Is that what you're asking? No, I, I'm, I'm, that, that may be what I'm ultimately trying to get to. I, I, I'm <coughs> trying to focus on the extent uh, I, I, I think I'm probably answering my own question, saying that the whole thing has got to be preordained in, in a soul and comes out like in a magic bullet that does the whole thing, as opposed to depending on events down in the world of the Spear Road, independent of a soul to unfold in this elaborate way. No, there is no, there are no Spear Road until it unfolds. Well, but there's, I mean, there's, it's not determined that it's going to unfold. I'm sorry? It's not determined. That's why they put will first. That okay, God well. first has to will it to happen. Then he decides it to happen. This is a very important issue during the 13th century. As I mentioned once before, people were killing each other over this issue. The issue, the Ein Sof, for some reason, decides that it's important to express itself, to manifest itself that it, it, it needs something else. Okay, let me, let me try to... That it's hard being perfect. I, I think you just tell me who I can, I can maybe articulate my question. When this first light emanates from main soul, right. is that light at that point ordained to unfold into ten throughout, or does it start in Keter? And we don't know. We don't know. We don't know, because it says, beyond this, we don't know. So we don't know. We can't read, you know, certainly we can't read God's mind meaning below here. So how can we read above here? We don't know. You know, you can't expect mystical texts to be non-mystical and, you know, be crystal clear. If they were crystal clear, then they wouldn't be mystical. That's why they like to use paradox to, you know, sort of enwrap the enigma in the mystery, as Churchill said. All right, so are, is it okay?
Well, so we, we can't know above Chachma, not below Chachma, though, we've got unfolding. Do we know whether that was pre-established? Yes, because told? that's all in the seed. That's all in the seed. Yes. But we don't know what was in the seed. We know there were, you know, the rest of the emanations in the seed, but whatever else, we don't know. So it's not as though Ain Sof has to reintervene for each of the six lower spheroes. It's already laid out in, in the initial seed. Concept. It's potentially there. I wouldn't say it's laid out. It's potentially there. And then it explodes and, and becomes it. But as we'll see in the Lurianic system, it doesn't work the way, even if you say it was ordained, it doesn't work the way it was ordained, so. I mean, I mean, look, look at this also on a, on a kind of psychological uh, level. One idea is God doesn't want to be perfect. It's boring being perfect. Or, that he's not, as Ein Sof, technically he's perfect. Absolute pure spirituality, absolute perfection. But where do you go from there? In other words, the idea that even Ein Sof, who is, you know, which is, you can't even say who is, absolute perfection needs to express itself in order to become whole. This, I think, is an interesting psychological, I mean, if you don't buy the rest, this alone, you, you might buy. It's an interesting psychological insight. And secondly, the idea that we'll see in the Lurianic uh, system, where it may be ordained that the Svirot unfold in a certain way, but even so, it doesn't work that way. In other words, that even God, who is the greatest artist, or greatest creator, or greatest whatever, greatest being, doesn't have things work out the way he plans. So, if even it happens to God, what do we expect? And that, thirdly, creativity and expression is a risk. Because it doesn't necessarily have to play out the way it was initially planned. So it's a big risk. Once Ein Sof, in a sense, compromises its own perfection, or decides to express itself, and eventually creates the world, and at least the lower sphere enter into a relationship with the world, the divine is at risk. Once you have Shekhinah reaching our world, being Ein Sof in a very diluted form, as I tried to explain last time. By that, God's presence in our world is in a state of vulnerability and risk. But apparently, up here somewhere, it's felt that such a risk, such a vulnerability, such an expression, such an unfolding, such a revelation, self-revelation, such a manifestation, is even better than being like this. Says a lot. Tells you how the Kabbalists think, if nothing else. Now, did that con was that concept then tied in with the flood story by the... Uh, no, no, not as far as I know. But the mere fact of creating human beings introduces the idea of imperfection and risk and everything else. You have it before you get to human beings. <coughs> two questions. Okay. Hope I have two answers. <laughs> um, <coughs> one question might sound like it's heresy. Good. I like those guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, is it that sowing a seed for its glory is for the glory of the seed or the glory of Elohim? No, it's for the glory of Chachma because once the seed is implanted and then it's given, it, it comes out of the womb and uh, Bina gives birth, 
then it's for the glory, like, you know, the children are for the glory of the parent. It expresses something of the parent. All right. So then the same thing is true with its praise? <coughs> yeah. Palace is its praise? Mm hmm For Chochmah again? Or is this time for Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. For Chochmah. Remember, again, you know, you have to take all of this figuratively. Even when, as I said before, they use terms like before and after, it's not before and after because all of this is occurring beyond time. And the Kabbalists continuously in their texts say, you know, give you very explicit descriptions. And then they say, well, don't take it literally. Because it can be dangerous if you take it too literally. Now, yeah. Part of that question is that if God is the end self, which he is. He's also all this stuff, too. Right. Uh, why does he need another vessel to bring forth another life? Well, I guess you'd have to ask him. I don't know. I don't know. You mean why is he doing it this way rather than yes. another way? I don't know. This, uh, this is just their system. Maybe he's not doing it this way, see, because you have to remember, I gave you this phrase once before. The Kabbalists like the phrase, Hakolafi Hamakabel. Everything is from the perspective of the recipient. The recipient. So this is all the way we see it. This may have nothing to do with the way it really happens, if it happens at all, and if we're here at all. Okay? So it's not heretical. It's pretty far from it. If you didn't have knowers, what point is knowledge? Now, there's, a, there's another question, Valger um, Does God make the, the people in order to um, extol his virtues and praise him? And, um, uh, is, is this egotistic? <laughs> Sounds like heresy. I, I. Depends well, who you ask. If you ask them, they probably say no. Makes them because he, he somehow needs another. It's not only, <coughs> you know, boring to be perfect, it's lonely. Then when you get later, like Moshe Han Rosado, isn't that sort of what he says, that uh, part of why we're here is to praise God? And well, this idea you already find in the Talmud, that everything we do, you know, the reason we're here is to praise God. That's sort of some of the urgic ideas that by our prayer... We enhance God. And God says, praise me. Yes, but the question is why? Yes. Does it really do anything for him or does it also do something for us? So here you have the flow up and the flow down. It also does something for us. But we'll get to the ego issues later. Oh, you've got it listed as something to discuss? Absolutely. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. Heretical or not heretical? <laughs> Any other questions on this text? All right, then I'd like to move to the next text from the Zohar, which you find on page 15. See on the right, page 79, mm -hmm. second line, someone like to read there? From this. From this we some. From this we may reckon it's so. One is the source of the sea. 
A current comes forth from it making a revolution, which is Yod, which is the first letter in the name of God. The source is one, and the current makes two. All right, so the source, which is the Yod, is one. That's Chachma. And the current makes two. And that's Bina. Okay. Then? Then is formed the vast basin known as the sea, which is like a channel dug into the earth, and it is filled by the waters issuing from the source. Yeah, and the sea is the third this thing. sea is the third thing. I'm sorry, I made it wrong before. You have the Yud, which is Keter. That's one. Then the current, the flow, makes two, is Chachma. And then is formed the Great Basin, which is the sea, which is number three, the third emanation, is Bina. And you notice that here, Bina is the sea, from which all life comes. Again, the idea of the primordial mother source of all life. Okay, and then from the sea, which is Bina, she gives birth, and then you have what? This vast basin is divided up into seven channels, resembling that number of long tubes, and the waters go from the sea into the seven channels. Okay, the seven channels are what? The seven lower spherot. So in other words, Bina gives birth to the seven lower spherot. And the water coming from Bina, which is the sea, flows down through the tubes. Down to where? Our world. Through the tubes, which connect the lower uh, seven spherot that Bina gives birth to. Got that? So you have one, two, three, and then plus seven is, <coughs> is ten, which are the ten spherot. And then f through those tubes, the divine stuff, which originally comes from Ein Sof, a current comes forth, the current originates in Ein Sof, flows down then to our world. Is this not a reference to the seven seas? Could be. Could be. Remember, everything here works on many levels at the same time, so it could be many things. Now, we already have in our list, just for these two emanations, about six things each of them are. So, at least a hundred more. Okay, now what happens? Together, the source, the current, the sea, and the seven channels makes a number ten. All right. So the source is Keter, which gets its flow from me and so. Mm -hmm. The um, current is Chachma, the flow, alluding probably to the seminal flow. Mm -hmm. And the sea is Bina, and the seven uh, channels are the lower seven emanations which make the number 10, which are the 10 emanations. Okay? Breathe. Yeah. If the creator who made these tubes should choose to break them, then would the waters return to their source and only broken vessels would remain dry without water? In other words, if the creator, namely Ainsof, decides he's had enough of all this, then the water, the flow, would all return to Ain Sof. And that's it. <laughs> and we're all gone. So the it fact that it... It's not saying it is a statement, it's saying it is a question. Well, it's a rhetorical question. Obviously they would. No, it's just it's read as a statement, not a question. I mean, it's stated that way, by punctuation. <coughs> well, they don't, the Zohar doesn't have punctuation. Well, by punctuation. 
the punctuation is there in English. Okay, so in other words, the implication is that the reason everything that exists exists is because of divine providence. An idea that becomes very critical later in Hasidism. There's a story about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, that he once pointed to a glass. And he said, this glass only exists because there is a divine spark within the glass, element within the glass, sustaining the glass. And if the divine <coughs> susten sustenance withdrew from the glass, there'd be no glass. And all of a sudden he pointed to the glass and the glass shattered and that was the end of the glass. You see, I'm not the Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> or at least, you know, he didn't have styrofoam. Okay. I have some more here. In this same wise, has the cause of causes derived the ten aspects of his being, which are known as Sfirot, and named the crown the source, which is a never-to-be-exhausted fountain of light, wherefrom he designates himself Ein Sof, the infinite. Okay, so everything flows down from Ein Sof. And you see here the use of <coughs> the analogy of the flow uh, to light, which is one of their favorite analogies. The other favorite analogy is to water. So you have a kind of inexhaustible flow coming down from above. Okay. <coughs> Neither shape nor form has he, and no vessel exists to contain him. Because he's infinite, so no vessel can, can, can contain him. Okay. Nor any means to apprehend him. In other words, he's above Chachma. So there's no way we can comprehend Ein Sof. There's no way we can apprehend Ein Sof. There's no way we can even think of Ein Sof. There's no way we can relate to Ein Sof. Ein Sof is above all of that. And therefore, <coughs> there became the need for God to express himself because after we're created, there would be no possibility of relating to God if God had remained ain't so. Okay. This is referred to in the words, refrain from searching after the things that are too hard for thee and refrain from seeking for <coughs> In other words, here again you have a kind of paradox, intrinsic in the mystical way of thinking. Some things are revealed, like here you're having the emanations and this whole thing revealed, and God is revealing himself in a way, but every time there's something revealed, it only indicates that there's more concealed than is revealed. In other words, the revealing of something lets you see something that you didn't see before. But it also lets you see what is concealed that you didn't realize was concealed before. So every act of revelation is also an act of a concealment. Again, the paradox. Okay. If any shaped a vessel diminutive as the letter Yud, and filled it from him, and called it wisdom gushing. So the diminutive letter of Yud here is Chachma. <coughs> and he called it and called it wisdom gushing fountain, and called himself wise on its account. Okay. And after he fashioned a large vessel named C and designated it understanding. So that's Bina number three and himself understanding on its account. Both wise and understanding is he in his own essence, 
whereas wisdom in itself cannot claim that title, but only through him who is wise and has made it full from his fountain. And so understanding in itself cannot claim that title, but only through him who filled it from his own essence. And it would be rendered into an ar aridity if he were to go from it. In this regard it is written, as the waters fail from the sea and the river is drained dry. Okay. So again, you have this idea of the polarity. That to have the completion or the uh, wholeness of the divine intellect, you need knowledge and wisdom. One without the other is incomplete. Okay? So we're at the sea, which is Bina. Now what happens? Finally, he smites the sea into seven streams. That is, he directs it into seven precious vessels the which he calls greatness, strength, glory, victory, majesty, foundation, sovereignty. All right. So these are the seven lower emanations. Mm -hmm. And again, this analogy of you had before the light going into seven different rays of different colors. Here you have the, sea, the analogy of the water going into seven different tributaries. In each he designates himself thus, great in greatness, strong in strength, glorious in glory, victorious in victory, the beauty of our maker in majesty, righteous in foundation. All things, all vessels, and all worlds does he uphold in foundation. In other words, all of the spherot come together, coalesce, in the ninth emanation, yesod, which is foundation. And if you look at the chart, you see they all converge in that one. Okay, then what? In the last, in sovereignty, he calls himself king, and he, his is the greatness and the strength and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. All right, this is a verse, as you see, from 1 Chronicles 29. Do any of you know where in the Jewish liturgy this is recited? Where in the prayer service this verse is recited? In the Torah service, where? Hmm? That's it. Vahagvura, Vahatiferet, Vahnezach, Vahod. So, this is you say when you're carrying the Torahs around. And of course, for the Kabbalists, this would refer to the different Sfirot. Now, you notice that they all converge, the flow converges on Yisod, and in your chart, which uh, identifies each of the sphero to one of the limbs of the divine body, which limb is this is a Yesod identified with? Right. So this is the phallus and it's flowing down. In other words, all the flow comes together there and from there it flows down into what? Shechina. Into Shechina, which is the lower mother. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? Shechina gives birth to what? The world. Mm. In other words, you have all, virtually the same process you have from Chachma to Bina, the upper father to the upper mother that allows Bina to give birth to the lower emanations happening between Yesod and, and uh, Shekhinah. The flow of divine stuff coale coalesces in Yesod, flows down into Shekhinah, and from Shekhinah down into the world, giving sustenance to the world. So therefore, Looking from where we are up, Shekhinah is the first aspect of the divine that we meet. 
the lower mother. Put another way, the first aspect of the divine that we meet is a feminine aspect of the divine. These tubes that they talk about, right. uh, are those supposed to be phallic symbols too? No, these are tubes carrying the divine stuff down to our world. They're channels. The Hebrew word they use is, is uh, tsinor, which in Israeli Hebrew means a hose. A hose, or elect they use it also for electrical wiring, mm -hmm. which I only learned last year when I hired an Israeli electrician, and he was trying to explain to me what he was doing, and his English didn't work. So, mm -hmm. okay. Continue. Um, mm -hmm. In his power lie all things, be it that he chooses to reduce the number of vessels, or to increase the light issuing therefrom, or be it the contrary. But over him there exists no deity with power to increase or reduce. Also he made beings to serve these vessels, each a throne supported by four columns, with six steps to the throne, in all ten. Yep. So there you have the ten emanations. Altogether the throne is like the cup of benediction about which ten statements are made in the Talmud. Harmonious with the Torah which was given in ten words, the Decalogue, and with the ten words by which the world was created. So they're trying to explain why they're ten spherot, ten rather than say nine or eight. They don't want to say it's because the Greeks believed 10 was the perfect number, which is probably the reason. So they have to come up with some other ideas. So they have to, you know, give you some other suggestions. 10 commandments, 10 words the world was created, 10 this, 10 that. Many 10s. So that's it. Please. What about the 11th one? The one's up between the two. Oh, Dea? Well, that's not really the eleventh one. It's only the eleventh one when this one, Keter, is considered too high and really part of Ainsof and therefore not one of the ten. The reason you have this one is to make it ten because if you eliminate this one, you only have nine. That's why they add that one. And then you have to remember against all of this there is the counter world called in Aramaic the Sitra Achra. which is the counter world, the other side, which is the world of the demonic. And our job is to do the good stuff and to try to decrease the power of the other side and to increase the power of the Shekhinah, who is very vulnerable to the other side. Okay, any questions about this? So because it's clear or not clear? Digesting this. All right, well, while you're digesting, then we'll take a look at the last text, <coughs> and that is on page uh, 19, God's withdrawal. Here you have a Lurianic text. dark print, the bold print, is the actual text in translation. The light print is commentary. You don't have to worry about that. Um, the Lurianic Kabbalah, as you could probably guess, as we discussed, is named after Rabbi Isaac Luria. Uh, his dates, if you're interested, are 1534 to 1572. The central place where the Lurianic Kabbalah flourished was in the land of Israel, particularly in the city of Safed, Svat, where Luria himself came only in 1569. 
So it was really in a period of, no, he didn't live long at all. In a period of about three years, you had the whole flourishing of the Luriana Kabbalah, or coalescence of the Luriana Kabbalah. <coughs> and the reason it was able to <coughs> develop so quickly is because you had a um, unusual coalescence of extraordinary people in the same place at the same time, <coughs> who got together and created the system that we call Luriana Kabbalah. I was flipping the channels the other day and I got to this movie, you may have seen it with John Wayne, of course, The Alamo. Of course. <laughs> and I always wondered, how come all these guys, you know, Daniel Boone and Jim Bowie and this guy, and we're all in the Alamo at the same place at the same time. This is sort of like the spiritual Alamo here in Safford in the 16th century. Yeah. And um, Lurie himself wrote very little, very little, not even a book. So how come he became so um, uh, so Popular. Well, apparently his views were views people liked. I'm going to explain that <coughs> in a while. And um, most of his teachings we know from uh, his students in a variety of forms, because uh, you know, I'm sure if I went around the room and tried to reconstruct what I said from all of your notes, I'd end up with as many different versions as there are people here. So, well, sometimes, yeah. As far as God is concerned, maybe not as far as I'm concerned. And um, one of his major students was Chaim Vital. Calabrisi. Who wrote down uh, Luria's teachings. And one of his major books is, is called the Sefer Eitz Chaim, the Book of the Tree of Life, and that's where this selection comes, that you have on page 19. So I'd like to take a look at this uh, text and then to try to flesh out a little more about the uh, Lurianic system and... Where, where, approximately, where did Luria fit in with, um, with Akiva or... Um, Akiva who? Akiva in B'nai Brak, Rabbi Akiva. He was 1,400 years later and a few miles away. <laughs> a few miles away. Well, if he were in Poland, he'd be more than a few miles away. But he was in Safed, so mm -hmm. in Israel, nothing's that far away. Okay, someone like to read? Someone read anyway. All right, please. Know that before there was any emanation and before any creatures were created, a simple higher light filled everything. There was no empty space in the form of a vacuum, but all was filled with that simple infinite light. This infinite light had nothing in it of beginning or end, but was all one simple, equally distributed light. This is known as the light of Ain So. Now again here, you know, when they say, know that before, it doesn't mean before, because this is all before time, so there's no before and after. But here in the Lurianic Kabbalah, you have a different approach as I outlined very briefly last time, that you have in the Zohar. In the Zohar, you begin with Ein Sof and a void. And Ein Sof emanates itself into this void. Here, you begin with the idea that Ein Sof is everywhere. Assume the circle is everywhere. So before there was any emanation, in other words, before the spherot were there, and before any creatures, in other words, before creation occurred. All there was was a simple higher light that filled everything. That higher light is, of course, Ein Sof. Absolute divinity, absolute perfection, absolute everything. 
there was no empty space in the form of a vacuum. In other words, there was not Ein Sof and a void. There was just Ein Sof. The infinite light had nothing of it in it of beginning or end, namely it's infinite. So there's no beginning, no end. But was all simple, simple me is another word for perfect, equally distributed light. And this is the light of Ain't Self. Okay? Now what happens? There arose. There arose in his simple will, the will to create worlds and produce emanations in order to realize his perfect acts, his names and his attributes. This was the purpose for which the world was created. All right, so there you have their view of why everything came into being. That the divine had the will desire to express itself. To realize his perfection. To realize his perfection. In other words, that perfection is not being static, as the Aristotelians taught. Perfection is expression. Perfection is encounter with the other. Perfection is relationship. Perfection is creativity. Perfection is action, not inaction. Okay? Ein Sof then concentrated his being in the middle point, which was at the very center, and he withdrew that light, removing it in every direction away from that center point. So again, here you have a kind of paradox, because if Ein Sof is infinite, how could there be a center? Right? But nonetheless, it means center, as we discussed in the analysis of the text last week, center is being the, the point of origin, so to speak. So Ein Sof moves out of himself into himself, withdraws into himself, creating a kind of void. This process in the Luriana Kabbalah is known by the word simsum, or contraction. Okay? There then remained around the very center point an empty space, a vacuum. This withdrawal was equidistant around that central empty point, so that the space left empty was completely circular. It was not in the form of a square with right angles, or Ain so withdrew himself in circular fashion, equidistant from all directions. Okay. The reason for this <coughs> Since the light of Ain Sof is equally spaced out, it follows by necessity that his withdrawal should be equidistant in all directions, and that he could not have withdrawn himself in one direction to a greater extent than in, in any other. It is well known in the science of mathematics that there is no more equal figure than a circle. It is otherwise with the figure of the square, which has protruding right angles, or with a triangle, or with any other figure. Consequently, the withdrawal of Ain Sof had to be in the form of a circle. Okay, it's a little lesson in contemporary 16th century geography. Nothing important. Okay? Now, after this withdrawal of Ain Sof, which left an empty space or vacuum in the very center of the light of Ain Sof, as we have said, there remained a place in which there could emerge the things to be emanated, to be created, to be formed, and to be made. Now, let me just stop you for a second there. These choice of these four terms is not random. These are the four worlds. Uh -huh. The world of emanation, the world of creation, the world of formation, and the world of action. In Hebrew, the world Olam HaAtzilut, Olam HaBriya, Olam HaYitzira, and Olam HaAsiya. You notice that, in, as I mentioned to you, I think before, in the gradation, emanation is the top, action is the bottom, and action is considered the least important, emanation the most important. Because emanation is a free flowing out of the self, sort of like a selfless flowing out, like what in Christian thought is called agape. Creation means creation of something from nothing. Formation means creation of something from something. 
And action is the most physical of all. So therefore, action is considered the least spiritual, the least self-sacrificing, and therefore uh, the lowest, the closest to the material world. Okay. But these are all things that, that are being made. Uh, emanation, bringing something in, creation, is, uh, creating something, formation is the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Creation is creating something out of nothing. nothing. Formation is creating something out of something. <coughs> like creating a sculptor, sculptor, sculpting out of a piece of wood. Okay? Mm -hmm. There then emerged? There then emerged a single straight line of light from his circular light, and this came in a downward direction, winding down into that empty space. So in other words, Ein Sof empties himself out of himself in the middle, creating a vacuum. In other words, pulls out of himself, empties himself out, and then you have winding back into the sphere that is now empty, into the, that vacuum, you have a line, a kind of tube. And it will be, as you'll see in a minute, through this tube that Ein Sof will then emanate into the vacuum, create the spherot, the four worlds, including our world. What's our world considered? Which one of those? Depends. According to some systems, it's the fourth one. According to other systems, it's below the fourth one. Okay? So the light comes down in a downward direction. Now what? The top end of this line derived from Ainsoth himself and touched him, but the bottom end of this line down below does not touch the light of Ainsoth. So what problem are they trying to deal with here? If the top touches Ein Sof and the bottom doesn't touch Ein Sof, that's why they like to, to be winding, to try to make it a little fudged. What, what problem are they dealing with here? Exactly. Okay. By means of this line, the light of Ein Sof is drawn down to extend itself down below. Into that empty space he caused to emanate, he created, he formed, and he made all the worlds. Okay, again, the use of the four terms. Before the emergence of these four worlds, Ein Sof was one and his name one in a wonderful mystical unity of a kind beyond the comprehension even of those angels nearest to him. For the mind of no creature can comprehend him since he has neither place nor living nor name. Okay, now, let me fill out what's not in this text you find in the other text. You have the withdrawal, the tzimtzum, in which creates an empty space with an ain so. Okay? Now, some texts refer to a kind of remnant in ain so that remains after ain so withdraws from this uh, vacuum called tihiru, which is, let me give this analogy. If you take a bottle of milk and you empty out the bottle, there's still milk around the sides. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a kind of remnant of the Ein Sof within the vacuum, so it's not completely a vacuum. A residue. A residue. Then, after you've had the inhalation, the withdrawal, you need the, the inhalation. After you've had the exhalation, you need the inhalation. So here you have the exhalation, the creation of the vacuum. And then through the tube that on the top touches, uh, on the top doesn't touch Ein Sof and on the bottom goes into the uh, vacuum, you have the divine stuff from Ein Sof emanating back in, coming back in. And that eventually creates what is called the Adam Kadmon, which is the primordial man, or the primordial Adam. 
Now remember, when you looked on the chart of the ten Svirot from the Zohar, you saw that each of the ten Svirot was um, identified with a limb of the body. Whose body? Body of God. And that is the Adam Kadmon. So that when the Bible says the human being was created in the image of God, the view here is it's in the image of the Adam Kadmon, of the Svirot, that human beings have in their makeup the same attributes as God. Chachma, knowledge, Bina, wisdom, Chesed, love, Din, justice. In other words, that the Svirot are not simply attributes of God, but they, they are related to psychological processes and attributes also of the human being. So whether you want to take it, you know, which they tell you all the time not to, literally, and say, well, when it says we create man in our image, it means here's this big, tremendous God, and then here, you know, it's a little us. You can take it that way if you want. But what they're saying is that God is the primordial Adam, the model for us, and God has all the attributes that he then gives to us. Okay? Now the difference between the Zohar and the Lurianic system is that in the Zohar the Sfirot are identified with, each, each of the Sfirot is identified with a limb of the Adam Kadmon, whereas in the Lurianic system the Adam Kadmon is an intermediary between the Ein Sof and the Sfirot. Because according to Lurianic Kabbalah, you have the flow back <coughs> of the Adam Kadmon, and then from the orifices in the head of the Adam Kadmon come out all of the lights. The lights that originate from Ein Sof. And the lights are trapped in vessels. Vessels in Hebrew is Kalim. And these kalim, or vessels, are the spherot. And according to the Lurianic storyline, the vessels, especially the lower seven vessels, are too weak to contain the light of Ein Sof, so they break. And this, in the Lurianic myth, if you will, is called in Hebrew the Shvirat HaKelim, or the breaking of the vessels. Again, the idea that in the process of creation is a inbred, as part of it, a process of destruction. That creation and destruction are part of the same process. That creativity is always a risk because it's always a destructive thing. It's always a creative thing, and it's always <coughs> a destructive thing. Also you have here expressed the tension between the infinite, namely the light of Ein Sof, and the finite, namely the, the vessels. Now, once those vessels break, the sparks from those vessels shoot all over. A question which remains unresolved in the Lurianic literature is, what are those sparks, sparks of? And you have two views. One is, at least two views. One is that they're sparks of the divine, divine sparks. And the other is that they're sparks of the original soul of the original Adam. <coughs> and then the question is, what, what's supposed to happen with all this? What's supposed to happen with all this is that we're supposed to redeem these sparks which are entrapped in shards or shells called klipot. Klipa means a shard or a shell. We're supposed to liberate the sparks from those shards which are caused by sin, by doing good deeds. 
And when all of the sparks go back to the way they were originally supposed to be, then you have messianic redemption. So it's a kind of Humpty Dumpty story, except that we are all the king's horses and all the king's men. God is Humpty Dumpty, and we can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. In other words, in this view, the human role in the process of redemption is pivotal, central, critical. And if you want the fancy uh, terms for it, um, the idea is that you free the sparks <coughs> and then you reconstitute the relationship amongst the spherot and that reconstitution, there are two kinds of terms for it. One is the one that you probably have heard about. Tikkun, not Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam is rabbinic. Tikkun is Lurianic, namely an act that brings about the reconstitution or the repair of the world or the repair of the spark. No, because this is not repair of the world. This is repair of the world plus the divine. And their major concern is it's repair of the divine, not of the world. They could care less. Today it's used, you know, connected with a politically liberal ad agenda, like Tikkun Magazine. It has nothing to do with that. It's a ridiculous idea to compare this to that. And then the second term that you find in the Lurianic Kabbalah is the term the partsufim. Partsuf means the face. Partsufim is the faces. And this means that through different common acts uh, you combine different forces of, <coughs> of the divine to uh, achieve different results of restoration. Let me just finish the thought. So let me give you an example. When, say, a third generation Hasid would meet another one. I'm not talking about these phony Hasidim running around today. But when a real Hasid would meet another, he would never ask him, first thing, how are you? Because who cares how he is, right? He would ask him, have you made a tikkun today? That's what's important. Have you done something to repair all of this? to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, to repair the divine, to repair the cosmos. Because compared to the disarray in which God is, with all these sparks all over the place, and the world is, who cares how you are, right? Because how good could you be if everything else is in disarray? So who cares? What things can you do for Tikkun? That's what I'm getting to now. So, in their view, say all of the mitzvot create tikkun. So if you do a commandment, that's a tikkun. If you do some moral deed, that's a tikkun. And then they had certain particular rituals that were considered rituals of tikkun. The one that you, most of you may have heard of is sort of practiced today, though I haven't really seen it. Uh, and that is the Tikkun Leil Shavuot. <coughs> a Lurianic innovation connected with the festival of the Shavuot. Any of you know what this is? What do you study all night? Putting together whatever you want. No, that's... Uh-uh. That's what, no, that's what they do today and call it Tikkun Lel Shavuot, you know, like I once was a scholar in residence at a synagogue, they had Hasidic weekend. So I didn't know what this meant, Hasidic weekend. <laughs> so they had a bunch of people sitting at a table with a bottle of vodka and they're drinking and singing songs from the Israeli hit parade 1948 and this for them is Hasidic weekend. So, you know, today people sit and they study a uh, commentary magazine or Tikkun magazine all night and they think this is Tikkun Lel Shavuot. Tikkun Lel Shavuot, there is a, liter there is a 
book where you have the curriculum. Every hour of the whole night, there is a curriculum. Verses from the Bible, broken down Torah, prophets, writings. Verses from the Mishnah, Talmud, Zohar. And each part of the night, you have a watch, and there are certain texts you study, and then after the whole night is finished, you finish the night. And this is supposedly the night the Torah was given. And if you're successful, <coughs> as the Luriana Kabbalists believe they were, then you create the tikkun, and then you are afforded what the people were afforded on the first Shavuot, which is a revelation of God. So that's how you know if you do it right. In other words, their idea is, isn't that revelation is something only in the past. Their idea is, as we discussed in the very first text, that the successful mystic, the true mystic, is the one who can attain what was attained by Moses at Sinai. Well, that's the purpose of the tikkun, to repair the world and, and to attain this. Another one you may have heard of is the Tikkun Chatzot. Any of you ever hear of that one? Tikkun Chatzot was a custom, midnight. yeah, midnight, of the Lurian Kabbalists to get up around midnight and to um, say certain prayers and lamentations for the destruction of the temple with the hope of the restoration, you know, of the world that came to an end with the destruction of the temple. They would sit on the floor with ashes on their heads and they would lament the temple. Like Exactly. Then you have, for example, it's on uh, before um, Jewish New Year, you have the Slichot. What time are you supposed to say the Slichot? Midnight. Midnight. Why? Because they have one of the code names for the Shekhinah is the moon. Tiferet is the sun, Shekhinah is the moon. And the idea is that just as the moon circumvents the earth, so the Shekhinah is in a kind of orbit around the earth. And it's in an orbit, elliptical orbit. So sometimes it's closer to the earth, right? And sometimes further. So the idea is that at midnight, the Shekhinah is closest to the world. So you, in a s literal sense, have God's ear at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's the best time to say certain kinds of prayers and to have an effect for the um, benefit of the Shekhinah. And what symbol is, is the sun? Sun is Tiferet. Now, Let me tie in one more idea, and then I'll take this question. Gershon Shalom, the first great modern scholar of Jewish mysticism, argued that there is a direct relationship between the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 and the ideas of the Lurianic Kabbalah. Whether it is or not, some later contemporary scholars have now doubted, but it seems to me there may be something to it. Shalom argued that the expulsion of the Jews from Spain was such a traumatic, traumatic experience for Jews around the world that <coughs> they developed a reinterpretation of all of Judaism based on the idea of exile. Jews were exiled from Spain. Now, the term in Hebrew for exile, galut, could also be translated in a more contemporary way, alienation. In other words, not being where you should be. Not being who you should be. Being out of place being out of sync, being alienated, being in exile. And Shalom argued that as a result of the trauma of the Spanish exile, 
The Lurianic Kabbalists responded in such a way as to interpret all, uh, to interpret everything as being in a state of exile. In other words, that not only simply are the Jews in a state of exile from Spain, but that everything is in a state of exile. Everything is in a state of alienation. Nothing is what it's supposed to be. Nothing is in a redeemed state. So God, this, they interpreted this idea of tzimtzum, Shalom did, as God going into exile within himself. So the people are, of Israel are in exile. God is in exile. And the soul is in exile. The soul is traveling to an exile. And this is why, says Shalom, I don't necessarily know if he's right, but there may be something to it. This is why, says Shalom, beginning with the Lurianic Kabbalists, an idea that you find earlier in Jewish mysticism now becomes exceedingly popular. And by the 17th century becomes very popular amongst the masses of Jews all over the world. And that is the idea called transmigration of souls. That not only <coughs> are the people in exile, but the soul is in exile. Just as the people go from one country to another country to another country, so does the soul go from one host body to another host body to another host body. And it's only then that you begin to see in the 16th century, in the Jewish popular literature too, this myth, some of you may know, called the Dibuk, mm -hmm. which is really an unrecycled soul. It's a soul that has left a body who died, but not yet been put into a new one, and therefore has to invade the body, possess the body of someone who's alive, in order to accomplish some kind of task. And if it st overstays its welcome in that body, then it has to be purged or exercised. And this is called the legend of the D book. She was waiting for a longer time. Oh, I just want to know if, it, if all these lower seven spheres are shattered, does that mean that they don't work properly? No, they don't work properly. The top three work, but the lower seven don't work. No, the top three don't work either. Oh. And you have different things you do to bring about a different part suf for the upper ones and for the lower ones. Does the evil Nothing works, that's the idea. Nothing works. And it's our job to, to make it work. That's the whole point. So it puts tremendous responsibility on the human being. And this is why I'm suggesting again that this popular idea that the mystics were, you know, social escapists is, is an absurd idea. Because they, they, they put tremendous responsibility on the human being. Because here, not only the individual, not only society, but even God, especially God, this position is determined by what we do. Now, that's if you take the sparks as being parts of God. If you take the sparks as being parts of the primordial atom, then it means that each of us, or everything that exists, has a spark of the soul of the original Adam. And that our job is to purify those sparks and return them to their original source, including the spark that we have in, in each of us. And if any of us does not do that, then it prevents all of the sparks from reuniting. Because as long as one spark is missing, the original Adam is not reconstituted. So therefore, as Buber said, each person is like a miniature messiah. Each person has a messianic role. And if even one person doesn't fulfill their messianic role, then the whole messianic redemption is, is thwarted. So in other words, in this view, every act a person performs can either accelerate or can retard the redemption. So it gives each person tremendous responsibility. Okay, sorry. Uh, I wondered about the Igor and the Ashes, the Dibbuk, uh, that comes out of the, the same 
totally no, it comes out of exactly the same construct, sure. It's a rather complicated thing because you have the Dibuk, then you have the Ibor, the impregnation. But the, the impregnation, the Ibor, where the soul of the righteous you're talking about, going into the soul of the wicked. Well, usually. Yeah, usually it's into the soul of the wicked because the idea is that unless the wicked is redeemed, then, you know, we're, always, we're, we're never going to get there. We're never going to get to messianic redemption. And that, then you have the risk. And the risk is that when the righteous invades the soul, invades the body of the wicked, in order to elevate the soul of the wicked person, the risk is that the righteous soul can, instead of dragging the wicked soul up, can itself be dragged down by the wicked soul. And this becomes the basis in Hasidism of what is called the fall being the prelude to the uplifting. In other words, that when the tzaddik, the righteous one, goes down into the level of the people, he can become corrupted by the people in as he's working with the people to try to elevate the people. That's always the risk. So he shouldn't go down. Well, but if he doesn't go down, then there's no way of lifting up the ones who are below. And it's interesting that in Hasidic literature you find exactly the same story, almost exactly the same period in time, attributed to Abraham Lincoln. There's some of these Hasidim in here were contemporaries. Namely, the story that a guy is walking by and he sees someone stuck in a ditch. So he tries to pull them out of the ditch. He can't pull them out of the ditch. So he has to jump into the ditch to try to push them out. So once he jumps into the ditch, what happens? One possibility is he pushes the guy out and then he climbs out. So that's a successful Ybor. Another possibility is he jumps into the ditch, he pushes the guy out, but then he gets stuck there. So he saves the other guy and he's damned. Another possibility is they're both stuck. So his mission is a failure. So that's why Ybor is very is very um, risky, but you compare it to some other traditions views of right of say righteousness or holiness. The assumption of the Ibor is that after the individual has gone through the wheel of transmigration many times and finally made it to the state of perfection, in most other traditions where you have transmigration of souls, they would say, you know, I made it. Right? I've arrived. Here, he doesn't say I've arrived. Here he says, though I've arrived, there are still other people who need to be helped. So I can't be really righteous if I'm content with the fact that I made it, but there are still those who haven't made it. So the really righteous is the one who has to go back and help the others, not the one who is content having made it, him or herself. <coughs> and this, I think, you may find is unique to to Jewish view. Okay, so you have it there too, then. And, you know, I don't want to get into all the complicated things, but according to some Kabbalistic systems, when you talk about transmigration of the soul, the question is, what is it that's transmigrating? The soul, but what is the soul? According to some Kabbalistic systems, the soul has five levels. Do they all transmigrate at the same time and together? So according to some, you know, the, they break apart. So you have different levels of the soul transmigrating in different ways to different beings. 
and then connected of course with the idea of transmigration of the soul is the idea of reincarnation which is that the soul does not necessarily transmigrate only to human beings in other words you have a sort of what they called in the middle ages a great chain of being going from say angels at the top to stones on the bottom and depending on what you've done in the previous world you can come back as anything on the chain so that's one of the reasons you have to be nice to styrofoam cups because maybe somebody you knew <laughs> and the question then is how do you redeem the spark in the styrofoam cup because that soul in the styrofoam how do you redeem that spark I mean a person can go do the tikkun they can do the commandments they can study this stuff they can figure it out but how is this how is this going to get out of there the so the idea is that through what we do with these things then they get, get to a higher level so if we do good things with these then they go to a higher level so next time it'll come back as uh, say a kosher hamburger or something like this and then it keeps going up until it gets to wherever it's going but it may also go down to a lower level and I don't know what a lower level would be uh, but it would come down to a lower level and then it would need to be redeemed. So the idea is that these sparks are transmigrating in their souls and they go up the ladder and down the ladder. And what you have essentially in this idea is a, a kind of Kabbalistic ecology because it means that you have to have a certain respect for and relationship with and save you don't have to save it in the sense of saving in your closet but you have to use it for worthwhile things you can't you know waste things and discard things for no reason um, have a kind of respect for the spark in in the inanimate object with the hope that that spark eventually climbs up the ladder and becomes something more maybe like a coca-cola bottle or something like that <laughs> Uh, Maybe it'd be nice to be a spark in some uh, work of art that, that you're always on display. Well, to some people, always being always on display would be the worst possible punishment right. they can imagine. So. But if you appreciate it, I don't know. It can't necessarily be a <coughs> punishment if people are, are admiring the work of art. Well, so. I'm sure all the sparks in the Manet exhibit down up the street are very happy. <laughs> now they'll be thrown back in their closets and places. And, and then you have the Hasidim. By the time you get the Hasidim, the idea that there are sparks all over the place and that each individual, so you don't have this yet in Lurianic Kabbalah, that each individual has an individual mission to redeem certain sparks that are somehow related to your own individual sparks of your own individual soul and that only you can do it. So, there are many ideas about this. For example, ideas that when you travel, the reason you go places is because there are sparks of your soul in these places that need you to redeem them. And no one else can do it. And that's why lives turn out certain ways. Yeah. Uh, I forgot what you said the Partufim were uh, uh, symbolic of or related to. The Partufim are recombinations of the divine forces or the Sefirot that we try to do with the performance of certain deeds to reconstitute the, the, uh, the divine faces. And Hebrew about is something that you can put on well, your face, a different face, by making faces. Well, this is also Hebrew, though a different Hebrew. It's a kind of reorganization of the Sfirot. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. reorganization of numeral pa numerical patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a few sentences, the mechanic by which Adam Kadmon was created from the Tihiru of the pipe and I, I, I kind of missed it. No, he's not created from the Tihiru. He, he sort of is emanated through the pipe. So 
somehow. Through the pipe, but the tahiru is, is clean to the pipe as a residue? No, the tahiru has nothing to do with it. There's another, you know, through the pipe comes the stuff from the Ain Sof through the pipe and emanates out the Adam Kadmon and then the Svirot rather than the Svirot as the Adam Kadmon. And where is the explosion that causes all these divine sparks or sparks of Adam to come? The explosion comes when the light are all uh, encapsulated in the vessels, especially the seven lower vessels, and the vessels are too weak to hold the light. So the light breaks through the vessels, the vessels shatter, sparks are spread. Pardon me? It's the breaking of the vessels, so you need them first in the vessels. And this again is the idea that within the creative process is the destructive process. Or to put it another way, that there is a kind of inbred catastrophe in the creative uh, experience. That creativity and destructiveness go together, up and down, good and evil, light and darkness, that you can't have one without the other. What I failed to mention is that this is all the Svirot, and then you have the worlds, and then somewhere out here on the fringe you have us. Because all of this is still happening within the world of the divine. So, say if this is the world of emanation, and we're in the world of action, or we're below the world of action, this happens, and then you have the worlds, and then there we are. So we're very distant from this, from Ainsof. Well, Ainsof is everywhere, so we're right there. Well, Ainsof is surrounding us, yeah. Is the idea of... Um, oh, yes, let me just mention one other thing. And if the Simtsum is the inhalation, right, and the, this is the exhalation, well, you don't breathe in and out only once. <laughs> so don't worry, they don't expect, you know, the next inhalation will be for a while. But the idea is that this is ongoing. And you can correlate some of this with certain meditative techniques of the inhalation and exhalation, but I don't want to get into that now. But, sorry. Is the uh, idea of the, the reincarnation and transmigration so first appearing in the Hellenistic literature, or was it resonant in Jewish thought earlier? It was resonant in earlier Kabbalistic literature. You find some possible references to it already in Midrashic literature. You find polemis, polemis, polemics against it in the writings of the first great medieval Jewish philosopher, Sadi Gaon, who says that people who believe in the idea of transmigration are heretics. He may have been referring to the Karaites, and the Karaites may have believed in transmigration. They weren't Kabbalists, necessarily. But you find the idea of uh, transmigration uh, earlier than the 16th century, definitely, much earlier probably. But it becomes enormously popular after the spread of Luriana Kabbalah. So I would even venture to say that when you get to about the 17th century, you would hardly find a Jew anywhere in the world who did not believe in it. In reincarnation? In reincarnation and transmigration even those who were into philosophy and rationalists mm -hmm. and enlightened and uh, in Western Europe. When did it change? It changed when the modern age came and everybody became rationalists. <laughs> but I mean, you take somebody like Menashe ben Israel, the guy who excommunicated Spinoza. He wrote a book, Nishmat Chaim, it's all full of this idea of transmigration of souls and dibuks and exorcisms and all this stuff. Almost everybody uh, was into it. And we're not into it today? It's up to you, but, uh, <laughs> but what? most people don't know we even have it, so they don't know whether they're into it or not. Is, would you consider that as part of the um, um, Judaic criteria that we have. What? What means Judaic that, that, criteria? That uh, 
that we have uh, reincarnation and transmigration. I'm not saying you have to believe in it. I'm just to be a good Jew. I'm just saying it's on the table. It's one of the many options we have. And that's the smorgasbord, and it's one of the plates on the smorgasbord. But I once, many years ago, met, had a young lady in my class who told me that she could not remain a Jew unless we had some idea of transmigration. And she went to many rabbis and they showed her this statement in Sadia's work that said that any Jew who believes in this is a heretic and she got very upset by that. I said, well, we have it, so just because they don't know about it doesn't mean we don't have it. So you want to take it, take it. You don't want to take it, don't take it. But you're asking me whether we have it, we have it. So if somebody asks, do Jews believe in reincarnation? That's a sociological statement, do Jews believe. Jews can believe, you know, in the tooth fairy. That doesn't mean <laughs> Judaism believes in the tooth fairy. You can say that in the history of Jewish belief, in the history of Jewish faith, or however you want to put it, one strand has been the idea of transmigration of souls and reincarnation. And at a certain juncture in time, this was the univer virtually universal and dominant strand. That you can say without any hesitation. Whether people want to do it today, that's their business. You know. I could make a better argument for transmigration of souls and reincarnation being part of Judaism than I can for, say, calling uh, an agenda of political liberalism called Tikkun Magazine, a uh, part of Judaism. I can make a much better argument for transmigration of souls. I have all the sources I can quote. I have no sources for this. You know? Now, some people don't want to think of the possibility that they may, you know, come back as a frog or a Styrofoam cup. Okay, fine. It's not my problem. Do Hasidim believe in that? Which, it depends which Hasidim. Most Hasidim, say in the 19th century, 18th century, did believe in that. The Baal Shem told the stories about him are full of stories about reincarnation, that he could look at a person and read the lines in their forehead and tell who they were and what they were in previous lives. There's a famous story, he came to a town and these people came to him and they were very haughty and he didn't like them. So he said, I see by reading the lines in your forehead that you shouldn't be so haughty. And the guy says, why? And the Baal Shem Tov says, because in your previous life you were a mouse. <laughs> so why be such a big shot here if your previous life you're a mouse? And I'm not going to tell you what you're going to be in the next life. So it might upset you. So. <laughs> or the famous Aptarav. It was the 19th century Hasidic master. You know, in the Yom Kippur liturgy, you have the Avoda service where you repeat the service the high priest said in the temple. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? So in the liturgy, it says in Hebrew, Vakach Haya Omer. Thus the high priest used to say. Right. When the Aptarav did this service, when he was the cantor in this service, he used to say, Vakach Haiti Ani Omer. Ooh. Thus, I used to say, when I was high priest. Mm -hmm. So he took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Very. There's a story about him that he was teaching a class, and all of a sudden a goat ran by the, the room. It wouldn't run by here, because we're on the eighth floor, but he didn't have any floor. <laughs> so he started to laugh, and the student said, why are you laughing? And he says, you, you see that goat? <coughs> he said, yeah. He says, well, in my, whatever it was, third or fourth, where it was, transmigration, I was the high priest of the temple. And we were giving the goat, you know, one goat they give to Azazel and the other goat they... So the goat that was going to be given to the, thrown down the rocky steep, the scapegoat, slipped out of his uh, hands and ran away. So he wasn't able to throw it down the steep. So he said, for six Transmigrations. I've been wondering what happened to this goat, <laughs> and now I know. <laughs> but the idea of transmigration is not new with Jews. You have it in some Eastern religions, and 
you know, if you studied mathematics, you know the Pythagorean theorem, right? The Pythagorean theorem, right? No. And Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans, believed in transmigration of souls. There's no question about it. If you read Diogenes Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers, he has a story that uh, Pythagoras was walking along the street with his uh, students, you know, because the Greeks used to teach uh, while they were walking, peripatetic, and they heard a dog bark. And Pythagoras turned to his students and said, I can tell by the sound of this dog's bark that it's my old friend Callias, or something like this. So he obviously believed in transmigration of souls. Or else my first everybody's leg. No, I don't know. I, my first professor in philosophy, history of philosophy, many years ago at Columbia University in New York, <coughs> John Herman Randall Jr. is a great historian of philosophy. He was teaching us this story in the fragments. And he said, well, I have to tell you, it's left out of the fragment what Pythagoras then said, after he said, I hear by the dog's bark that it's my old friend Callias. So we all looked at him, you know, like, Maybe he had some fragment that wasn't never published or something. So he says, well, it just stands to reason what Pythagoras then said. He said, Callias was a son of a bitch then, and he's a son of a bitch now. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this in other traditions, too. But we have it, so you can use it. Any questions about any of this? One final point, then we'll take a little break, and that is that this group that clustered around um, Luria, you can see a very good essay, you can read a very good essay about it by Salman Schechter called Safed in the 16th Century. It's in Schechter's Studies in Judaism, where he gives you a very nice portrait of all these great scholars that clustered around Luria. And I just want to mention uh, two of them. One is um, Rabbi Joseph Caro, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, the last authoritative code of Jewish law, because here you have a major other misconception, namely that mysticism is somehow antinomian, against the law, against the observance of Jewish law. It's the opposite. Here you had Caro, who was deeply into mysticism, one of the core members of the Lurianic group who believed that he received revelations from a mystical mentor called a Magid, whose name was Mishnah, um, was core member of the Lurianic group and wrote the last authoritative code of Jewish law. The second person is Solomon Halevi Alkabetz, who um, was the brother-in-law of the great Jewish mystic Rabbi Moses Cordovero who is assumed by everyone to be the author of a prayer many of you know, because his name is actually an acrostic in the prayer, called the, which is recited Friday night, called the Lecha Dodi, which is said as part of the service welcoming the Sabbath. And you see his name, if you read the first letter of each stanza, Shlomo Halevi spelled out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe now with some of this um, Kabbalistic symbolism, you can figure out what that prayer is all about that you may have been saying for all these years. Because it's not what anybody thinks. Who wrote so far in the Solomon Schechter. I once gave a lecture in Northbrook about mentioned uh, Jewish mysticism and mentioned Solomon Schechter's works on Jewish mysticism, and a lady in the question and answer period said, I always thought Salman Schechter was the guy that gave a lot of money, so they <laughs> na named these Jewish day schools after him. <laughs> but what has really bothered me is when they built the first Salman Schechter school out here in Northbrook, they sent out an invitation for the opening of the school, and they said, and he, they had an Hebrew side and an English side. So they had Salman Schechter day school, and in, English they, in Hebrew they had Shlomo Shechter. Well, Shlomo is usually Solomon, but Solomon Shechter's name was not Shlomo. He was, his Hebrew name was Shner Zalman because his father was a Lubavitcher Hasid, and he was named after the founder of Lubavitcher Hasid, Shner Zalman of Ladi, which people up at his school didn't know.
I'm sure if he was the guy who gave them money, they would have got it right, but they didn't get it right. All right, so we'll take a little break here and, and discuss some more esoteric things. creation and with creation comes destruction if the process of creation is something coming out of nothing what is getting destroyed that's a very good question and a very rational question which they wouldn't ask first of all but when they talk about something coming creation of something out of nothing. Let me spend a minute discussing this. In medieval philosophy, one of the big questions was, going back to the Greeks, is creation something out of something or something out of nothing? Okay. Say you have already in the early mythologies the idea that there is some kind of primordial stuff that exists forever and the creation is not something out of nothing but is a kind of reforming of that primordial stuff. So say Aristotle, for example, continues this view in his philosophy that there was a primordial stuff and that the unmoved mover, as he calls it, creates the world out of this primordial stuff. The unmoved mover, he called it, means God, in other words, mover. In other words, the thing that moves everything else but is itself unmoved. Now, in medieval Jewish philosophy, this was a big issue of debate. Did God, did something coexist with God eternally, and God then took that thing and reformed it and created the world? Or did God exist forever alone and then God created whatever it was and then from that formed the world? And there's a big debate running throughout all of Jewish philosophy and most of them come down on the view that God created the world from nothing because if there was something that coexisted with God then it's like another God. This doctrine of creation of something from nothing is called in medieval philosophical Hebrew yesh me ayin. Yesh me ayin means there is from where? There is not. Ayin. Ayin. There is not. There is something from where before there was nothing. There is from nothing. Now, when the Kabbalists came upon this term in medieval philosophical Hebrew, they said, what does it mean, say, within our system? And here's how they interpreted it. Yesh, because remember, everything for them is a code name, right? Yesh is the code name for, guess what? God. That's too simple. Too simple? You saw it. <laughs> for the emanation Keter, the first emanation, which is part of God, is Yesh. So they interpret Yesh me ayin means Yesh me. Yesh comes from ayin. What's ayin? Ain't so. See? So they, so the philosophers said yesh me ayin means something from nothing. What in Latin, in what in medieval scholastic philosophy they called creato ex nihilo, creation from nothing. So, in the medieval Jewish philosophical literature, it's something from nothing. The Kabbalists read it, something from nothing. That the Sfirot come from nothing. 
because Ein Sof is nothing. See, it's no thing. It's not a thing, so it's nothing. In other words, the idea is that somethingness comes out of nothingness, and that the ultimate being, the ultimate being that exists, namely God, the Ein Sof, is a no thing. Nowhere, no how. So they wouldn't ask this question, but they would answer it this way. So do they believe God's being destroyed by the creation of? God's, yes, God's perfection, so to speak, God's state of, remember when they say the light is equidistant and, and equi, you know, spread and it's everything and it's perfect. Yes, God's perfection is compromised by his creativity. And, and it seems to me that this may be their polemic against the Aristotelian notion of perfection, that perfection is being static, that perfection is unchangeable, and that that kind of perfection, being static, unchangeable, not in relation to anything or anybody, is undesirable. And that creativity is desirable even though it's destructive. You see, I once wrote a, an article about the difference between Christian ethics and Jewish ethics. And one of the points I tried to make there is that in Christian ethics, <coughs> in my view, you have a messianic view of the world. Everything has to be, you know, sort of assuming a, a, a redeemed world. So, Everything is either or. And Jewish ethics, on the other hand, I suggest that it's not a messianic ethics, but a messy ethics. <laughs> because it assumes a messy world. And creativity is a messy business. If you ever watch The Birth, it's a messy, destructive, messy business. But it's a wonderful thing, right? So, the two go together. And here again, as I said before, you have part of the response to the problem of evil. That good is meaningless without evil. Up is meaningless without down. Creativity is meaningless without destructiveness. Mm -hmm. You always need this balance. You always need this, this polarity, so to speak. Now, as I think I mentioned also once before, the dominant view you find is that only God has these kinds of creativity. Human beings can only get this far. In other words, when a human being creates something, they're always creating something out of something else. Only God can create something out of nothing. When an artist creates, a, say, a composer creates a musical composition, the sounds are already there, they already exist. When a painter creates a painting, the paint is already there. Canvas is already there. Or a sculpture, the wood or the marble, whatever it is, is already there. And in order to create it, they have to destroy it. If you ever watched a sculptor at work, it's a very violent thing hammer, a chisel, a whole business. But then if they produce something, it's you know, a credible thing. Well, what are you destroying if you're composing? Well, you throw out a lot of paper. You throw out a lot of different sound combinations. If you're like some composers, I know you bang on the poor keyboards a lot. Throw little temper tantrums. Yeah. Sounds like God went to a higher level when he destroyed part of himself in order to create heaven and earth. Right. And if that's true... Not first heaven and earth, first to create himself, okay. to unfold himself. And if that's true, why would we want to do deeds to put him back into this perfect state, which is at a lower level? We don't want to put him back to the lower... Our deeds don't put him back to the lower state. Our deeds create the balance and the reconfiguration of the sparks so that evil doesn't overpower the world. When he's ready to go back into his uh, cocoon, 
as they described it, he'll go. But in the meantime, history goes on, and our job is to, you know, fight on the side of the good guys, Humpty Dumpty's army, and against the bad guys, which is the Sitra Akhra. If you want to put it another way, say the Shekhinah is like the princess, you know, and we're all protecting the princess from the bad guys, from the dragon, which is the Sitra Akhra. We're all on a mission. Yep. Is there a correspondence with the Ten Commandments to the Ten Spirit? There is correspondence to the Ten Commandments. You saw it in this text. Ten, ten words with which God created the world. All kinds of things. But I mean, is there one that goes with each one? Is no. There, no. No. What about the 631? 613. 613. Can we sort those out? No. I'm sure some Kabbalist has done it, but I, I haven't seen it. It's not a question of an opinion. I'm sure someone has done it. Yeah. Now, let me tell you to conclude the story of Joseph de la Reina, who is always associated with the Lurianic movement, even though he probably wasn't part of it. The story is that Joseph de Laurent, there are various versions of the story, I'll give you the simplest one, that he was a member of the Lurianic group, one of these great rabbis that clustered around Isaac Luria, and he decided that he would bring the Messiah himself with the help of five disciples. So there is a tradition that the Messiah will come when the uh, devil, who is, a, who is identified with the evil inclination, is captured brought to the Temple Mount and slaughtered. Then the Messiah will come and the Temple will be rebuilt. So they have all kinds of stories about how Joseph de Lorraine and his five disciples go and track down the devil. How the devil tries to avoid them. Usually why, how he changes himself into all kinds of big black dogs. Many Jews are afraid of dogs, you know. Most East European Jews were terrified of dogs. Right. They were used for hunting them. Right, but they also had these demonic connotations. Mm. And Joseph de la Reina tried to capture the devil, the devil played dogs, so he used magic spells and charms and all this because he was very prepared for this. And finally he captures the devil and he puts the devil in a cage. And they're dragging the devil through the desert, you know, in the Middle East it's hot to Jerusalem to be killed. And on the way to Jerusalem, the devil says to Joseph de Lorena, I'll agree to go, I'll agree to go to Jerusalem, but it's so hot, can you just give me some water? So Joseph de Lorena goes over to his cage, gives him some water, and the devil grabs his hand, takes the key, opens the door, and, and gets out. And then there are two endings of the story, were written later, I mean after the original story. One ending is that Joseph de la Reina despaired so much that the redemption would ever come that he committed suicide. And the other ending of the story is that Joseph de la Reina converted to become a Catholic, became a priest, and became the father confessor of the Queen of Spain. That's where he gets the name de la Reina of the Queen, which for them was even worse than suicide. And the moral of the story, uh, the morals are two. One moral of the story is that you should not have mercy on the evil people. There's a statement in the rabbinic literature, he who is merciful to the cruel will end up being cruel to the merciful. But the major 
moral of the story is that you should not try to force messianic redemption to come. That it will come in its own time, and if you try to force it, you'll end up in a catastrophe. And some scholars now take this story as a rebuttal of Shalom. Because remember I mentioned to you that Shalom said the whole Lurianic business was all in response to the expulsion from Spain. And here now, contemporary scholars are saying, no, this messianic motif that Shalom sees coming as a result of the expulsion from Spain, that we have to bring the Messiah after this great catastrophe of the expulsion, is wrong. Namely, that it, within the Lurianic movement itself, you have a polemic against this messianic motif. But none of us were there, so we don't know. What was his uh, ending to the story? He didn't have an ending to the story. There's uh, some debate whether he even existed. Uh, yeah. I just read a, an, an, another ending that he turned into a black dog, and uh, the RE recognized him pointed it out and he realized that he was a black dog. I had never heard this ending, but this sounds like an American ending. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't sound like a Jewish ending. Do you know who, what was his name? Dean Howells, is that his name? The father of American realism, realism in literature. Anyway, whatever his name is, something like this. He said, that's, well, Schwartz, it makes every, a lot of things American. This guy said, I'll, I'll look up his name, it's something like this, Dean Howells, Ng, or something like this. He's a father of American realism. He greatly influenced Hemingway. He said, Americans like tragedies with happy endings. <laughs> so, this is a tragedy with a happy ending. Did it turn into a dog? No, that he turned into a dog and then the RE recognized him and then redeemed him. No, that he didn't redeem him. That, then it's not, a poss it's not a possibly a Jewish story because I'm sure the RE would have redeemed him. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise he wouldn't be the RE, right? Yeah. Right. All right, so on that happy note, I wish you all a good week. And then next week we will begin with topic three in terms of the goals. What were the goals of the Jewish mystics in terms of their experiences?